Oh. Hi, my name is Alexey Borisenko, and today we are going to talk about uh, retrieval augmented generation and AI agents. Before we dive into our topic today, I'd like to ask each of you to briefly introduce themselves and share how their work and expertise relates to RAC and AI agents and generative AI technologies. John? Hi. So thanks for having us on here. So yeah, we're interested in talking to you about our domain specific agents and how we use RAG. My name's John Perello. I'm a principal engineer at Cisco. I run the engineering at our Cisco Innovation Labs. So our Cisco Innovation Labs are customer innovation centers that we have all over the world. We have um, five primary locations, uh, but wherever, wherever you see Cisco and have Cisco people, we have somebody there. Uh, what we try to do is work with customers on their problems and then see how we can use Cisco solutions or any solutions um, and help them with their with their problems. It, it, we wind up being very forward looking, uh, looking at the future. And right now, you know, it's pretty easy to look at the future, right? Like we used to have to be like, oh, wow, what's going to be coming up? What's going to be? For, it's it's all AI all the time. And that's what we're seeing. So that's what we wanted to talk to you about um, what we're seeing with domain specific agents specifically with using RAG and any, adding our own content to agents. So that's what we'll talk about. Thanks for having us. DevNet's awesome. You know, all the developers out there, we're going to have like some cool stuff coming out for you. So happy to talk yeah. to you. Yeah, thanks a lot, John. Uh, Cody? Hey, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm Cody. I'm a software engineer. Work in the Cisco Innovation Labs team with John. Um, and I originally kind of got into this space as we were responding to different projects that were coming in from customers that we had. And then at some point kind of stepping into more of an R&D space of looking at what does the future kind of hold for uh, for AI agents and looking at can we kind of project where things are going to go and, um, you know, start to build kind of processes and mechanisms um, for where we see it to go. So I've been working with uh, uh, LLMs, agents um, for about maybe a year now. Yeah. Thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Cody. And Flo? Uh, yeah, hey everybody. So I'm uh, Flo Pachinger. I'm a colleague of Alexi. So I also like focused a lot on rec on on agents. And yeah, like you maybe might have seen like my other video on on this YouTube account where uh, how to put uh, like how to create an API in the AI assistant with uh, Cisco Catalyst Center there. So uh, nice to nice to be here. Yeah, thanks a lot. And my first question. Uh... We can find a bunch of agent uh, workflow with Excel files, for example, um, agents that can retrieve information about latest news or stock prices. Which agents do you think can help network engineers, DevOps, and app developers in their work? So, which agents can they use with uh, with? That? I mean, I, the thing that we're seeing now is that there's a proliferation of uh, proliferation of agents everywhere. And everybody's trying to add their own custom data to it to to make it specific to what your problems are. So one, it could be for net for us in networking, it's like we want to talk to our gear, we want to find out what's going on in our network. If you're in HR, you want to find out what's going on in your in your HR uh, program. You want to find out about employees. If you're in finance, you want to get stock prices and things. So what's going on is everybody's starting to grab these and make domain specific agents for their problem for their company. We were just talking about this before the before we went live. If you could roll back the clock to 1996 and say, what was going on with web servers? Your question is, what kind of web servers should I be using? That that was what the question would be in my company. Well, everybody's going to make a specific website given whatever web tools that they can find for their business. And that's what's going on. People are going to constantly be building up these agents so that's what we're seeing. It, it almost doesn't matter it, it, which ones they are. It's like find the tools that you that you that you're comfortable with and the ones that you can work with and the ones that you can pay for, but then start adding your own your own information to it. And then I think Cody, we could talk about the ones that you've liked because so Cody's been working on this stuff and picking the ones that he likes. So there's ones that you like there. It's like it's like which ones are cool to work with. Any one of them where you can add your own data is going to be the right one. But there's some that you're you're working with. So Cody, why don't you talk about some of the ones that you yeah, think? Yeah, well, there's kind of a few ways that uh, that I think about it. One is um, kind of the typical retrieval augmented generation. Where you're trying to 
essentially you take large language model and augment it with you know a specific data that that you care about another way is another way we think about it is how do we um how do we interact with apis for instance so if we have a thousandized api can we create a natural language assistant on top of that that can interact with systems and then the final kind of approach that we looked at is model fine tuning so if we have a very large data set um, how can we actually kind of uh, subtly retrain a model, an already powerful model, with the data that we have. So we've looked at all these different techniques for how do we create agents um, that can kind of best achieve results, but also interacts with uh, with the environment that we have. So interact with services, interact with APIs. Um, so one early one I built was essentially an agent around the Thousand Eyes API. And that gave us kind of full access to natural language um, prompting towards a thousand eyes API. Yeah, one of the ones we liked was uh, right, Cody. If you talk about maybe uh, we were looking at the gor the gorilla stuff, where we say when you take a bunch of different agents and you start to work together with them. So that was a fun one to work with. Like if if I had to say, is there one to get used to? It's like one of those, right? So maybe talk about that one. Um, a gorilla, yeah. So gorilla is an interesting project that came out. I think uh, UC Berkeley is the one that uh, originally developed it, but they were looking at uh, how do we train a model that um, it natively interacts with APIs and services. So they essentially scanned all of GitHub um, and looked at different API calls, and this could either be functions or actual kind of network API calls. And they fine-tuned a llama model um, that can now accurately generate an API call. So an example, let's say I want to, um, through natural language, make an API call to Uber requesting a ride, right? So if you ask a typical uh, large language model, get me a ride um, from A to B uh, with this type of car, it's likely not going to have you know, the understanding of how to translate that natural language into the, uh, the correct API call. But this uh, model that they created can now easily make that translation. So what are the few things that it does? It finds the correct API um, call that it needs to make, and it'll correctly, in most cases, fill in the parameters that it needs, given the natural language, into the kind of structure API um, that it had. So this is kind of a powerful model because it allows you to now interact with uh, with services it makes that translation between just natural language and now kind of the world of services that we live in yeah maybe taking a step back there's there's like three things that, that cody and i we were talking about when we were thinking about this topic you can fine tune an llm as cody was saying it gets expensive it's it's not real time an example of that might be like fine tuning an LLM to make an expert on Ansible or something for Cisco gear, like, okay, create an Ansible playlist for, you know, for us on Cisco gear. You could fine tune, you could sit there and you could fine tune it. But with RAG, what you're doing is saying, well, wait, hold on. I have something that's trained well enough. I want to amplify it with whatever kind of data. So that would be more like I could have something that's trained and maybe I want to go to all the Cisco product sheets and add the Cisco product sheets to that to make it smarter. And I can ask the question, which, how much power does this one use? How much, how much energy is being used on this from the product sheets? So that's, I didn't have to fine tune that model, but with RAG, I can add to all the information that's there. But then the benefit of, of going the next step is saying, okay, I want to add tool calling where I want to do live API. And that's what you were talking about. Do I want to get live information from stock tickers? We worked a lot with electricity maps, finding out what is the real time carbon usage of somewhere so we know is your switch running on diesel coal or natural at the at the time right so there's three levels you can you can train it you can enhance it and then you can do live api calls and this whole rag um effort really works well in that you can add data but then also you can make a, an agent that is domain specific then you don't have to fine tune it you fine tune it enough but then add the information from your site so fine tune your web web server from somewhere and and host up the documents in your company and it, that what you've done is you've made a web server that's that's custom you you want to do that same thing with agents but that's like you're in 3d now when you're doing it in ai before you were doing 2d where you were just giving it data and you were hosting web now you're like whoa i can add all this stuff to it that's where where you want to go you want to start building these domain specific agents 
and and the the whole rag motion is is what does that. And Cody's been becoming like an expert on this, not becoming like an expert. He is <laughs> an expert on this stuff. He's been sitting there with uh, with us going through all of the different types of things that we're talking and building them for us. So he's built a whole bunch of a whole bunch of um, agents for us for the innovation labs. Yeah, and I would just mention here too, there's kind of two separate problems that we've looked into. One is how do we achieve accurate results? So, you know, if you look at the world of LLMs, it's crazy how much, um, you know, progress has been made in terms of accuracy, benchmarking. And we've talked about some of the, you know, ways that you can achieve accurate results, even real-time accurate results being rag or fine tuning. But the other piece is how do we then make these models interact with the outside world. And that's a big piece of the agent um, kind of um, logic and mechanism there as well of like, now we have maybe accurate results, but how do we utilize those? How do we create a runtime that takes those generated results um, and uses them in a, um, you know, a useful manner? So again, I can take the example of like API calling. So if I take the gorilla model and I ask it, can you, um, can you write an API call for me to get an Uber ride from A to B in uh, luxury? Uh, so it'll generate that. But then so now someone needs to take that uh, string that is now just a natural language, and it needs to go and execute that and make that possible. And that's where libraries like Langchain or, and there's a few other runtimes come in of giving the LLM now a set of kind of logical steps to, to execute um, what is generated. And that's where I think they become really powerful if now it can not only generate the response, generate what the API call should be, but it can actually make that API call. And that, that's where the power of it comes in is, is again, I'll keep, I'll keep beating down the web server analogy, but what, what everybody seems to be doing right now, and again, we're the Cisco Innovation Lab, so we kind of see what everybody's doing in the trend. The trend is to try to start up models grab the information, then ask you questions about it. And everybody's like, whoa, that's equivalent to like putting up a web server and saying, hey, look, I could read the docs. The power of this is going to come in and like very quickly where you can then enact change and actually do something. And that's where you need the live API calls. When, you know, how many switches, uh, how many switches are running, uh, are running this much power right time? That's a question. But the power of that is going to be, hey, turn off all of the ports in my, in my company that have that are not used right now or have low utilization uh, for for energy like the poe ports or something like that or any kind of an interaction that's going to be the next level so let's get some more questions we, we went down that, that whole topic. <laughs> we could talk forever on this but yeah, yeah. yeah. uh you, you've mentioned about uh, benchmarking um to be honest i don't find any benchmarking related to, to network technologies like uh, observability or something like this uh, which uh, llms uh, like foundational models or uh, some open source you prefer to use in in your agents um i've used a few different ones um i mean the llama models so i primarily when it comes to open source models i will go through hugging face and I've tested a few different, uh, I would say a good amount of models from Hugging Face. But for us, I think we're not as much focused on the actual model choice um, and development of kind of agents around models, more looking around kind of the, um, the scaffolding around building agents and um, how do we see organizing and, um, and interacting between agents. So. I would say, yes, I've looked at models like the Llama, Llama 2 models, um, pull up a few ones from Hugging Face. But again, our focus has been less on the specific types of large yeah. language models and more about the frameworks and scaffolding that we use around them. Or the volume, right? Like, so DevNet, right? Our, most of the DevNet users and stuff, we're all networking people, you know, one or two I'll put it in networking terms. One or two switches are not interesting. Talk to me when you have 10,000. You know, that's the type of, of thing that people are working on. So for us, we're taking that same approach when it comes to LLMs. One or two are interesting and we're going to keep playing with them, but we know that people are going to have, you know, thousands of these things running. And what happens when you go from the classic pets, I have a pet and now I have a cattle. I have tons of these things and going in there. And that's what we were doing. So we like to look at the specific uh, models and the specific LLMs, and we have preferences in the ones that we 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 use because they're easy to use. 
but we want to stay neutral to it. And I think that's where Cisco does well. We stay neutral to it, right? The, the internet always wins, right? So AI is going to win this stuff. Which model? Pick the one you like the best, the one that has the language you know. If you know Go, you're going to pick a different one. If you Most of the stuff's in Python, so hey, go, go with the one you know the best. And, and Cody, if you got the ones from Hugging Face or something like that, those are the ones that, that we go to. They're the ones that are the popular ones. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know if anybody's are... really getting to the point of benchmarking these things yet, where it's like, I think everybody's just happy to have one. Right. I think they're happy to have one and work with it. And then please, God, don't run up my bill. That's yeah. Really I think um, things are changing so fast, especially in the open yeah. source world now that, I mean, you have your staples, the GPT-3, GPT-4 that I've, you know, used in several agents. Um, but I think we're starting to see for certain specific tasks like, um, tool calling, there's now fine-tuned llama models that can maybe compete with the accuracy you get close to it, but are um, are free. You're essentially hosting it yourself. The burden becomes your own infrastructure, not the API cost. Um, so I think it's kind of a, for me, it's a bit of a trade-off. So if I want to build an agent quick and easy, I might start off with something like GPT-4 and utilize API calling and Langchain. Um, but you know, as we scale and maybe want to open this up with an enterprise, okay, now let's move away from something like GPT-4 and look for the specific agent um, actions that we're trying to do. What type of open source model um, can we use? Is there a fine-tuned llama model, for instance? A classic example is code generation. So um, there is GitHub Copilot that came out and um, a few other kind of variants of it that you um, you know, GPT-4, uh, and essentially we'll be generating code, um, code completions um, using that model. But there's other models that came out that were fine-tuned for code generation that can now compete um, with those models. And you can essentially download, install that from Hugging Face, and then install that into your own workspace and get a similar result. So again, I think the models are evolving so fast that we've looked more at kind of agent mechanisms as opposed to models themselves. I think maybe one thing, if I could, again, Cisco Innovation Labs, and then talking to the audience of, of you all of DevNet, we know you guys are developers. You're, you're great developers and you're the people that, that start to work on this. So we tend to focus on, on which model, which code and everything, get the data lakes in order. Right, that's the biggest thing that you're going to need because with RAG and when when you start to add the information to the to the models, that's what's going to be important. And getting that information together is going to help you along the way. For me, I, you know, many years ago, I did, I did my I, I did my uh, graduate work in AI and stuff, and it was too far ahead of the time. But I had always been taking and squirreling away and storing all my documents that I had on one server and just constantly upgrading it at home, and. I, now, once the models are there, it's like holy cow! I've got all this information. I could just put a, I could just put an agent in front of it, and I've unlocked all the data. You know, clean out your garage is one thing, and then what we'll do at Cisco is we're going to try to experiment on on the different ones, and then try to help you organize this stuff. We're going to be coming out with tons of stuff like Matific and these other things, and stuff that we're coming out from the lab. When we have those, we're gonna we're gonna help you on this. Stuff. I think getting the data together is probably really important right now. Um, but let's go up to another question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Flo, you recently released um, Assistant for uh, Catalyst, uh, where, where you also utilize retrieval augmented generation. What questions do you have to, regarding these technologies and topics that we discuss? Yeah, sure. So, like, um, like uh, I think this this conversation is really great, and and uh, the the discussion about it, the agents or agent frameworks, or like how where we are going, should be definitely LM agnostic. So basically, saying okay, um, I I want to choose this specific LM, and uh, based on that, I can put um, like more of my functions uh, towards this LM, or like um, basically, if I want would like to uh, switch the, uh, the agent or would like to replicate it or use it in another way, I think this is definitely very important there. And um, also, like uh, to you, to your uh, like uh, statement, John is like um, definitely bring your data lake, data warehouse, lake house, wherever what you would like to call, like bring it definitely together. Yeah, and okay, also yeah. like have like a, a proper um, 
like a proper understanding there and also uh, and uh, a process how to put the data together and how to put it like specifically in in a in a vector database um like this brings me actually to my question about and i think it's very important about the, the chunking methods or the chunking of the data and embedding into the vector database so this whole uh, process which is of course very important for rag um do you have any um uh, like cody or john in a way do you have any like best practices or any key learnings there for the audience uh how to chunk the data how to embed it into a vector database um and and then like how this this whole process looks like um maybe to explain a bit like but mostly about the key learnings i'm, I'm asking mm -hmm. yeah so we've looked into using a few different vector databases so first of all looking at kind of what database um are you wanting to work with you have you know, something that you are already familiar with. So, you know, something like MongoDB, Elasticsearch. So we've utilized Elasticsearch um, for that because um, we already had kind of a, a cluster, Elasticsearch cluster running for us. So I think just initially choosing a database that works for you that maybe you're already familiar within your stack. Um, and then we looked at just kind of uh, varying the chunk sizes and trying to see um, evaluate accuracy based on chunk sizes. Um, but I would say in the last kind of six months or so, I focused more on the kind of agent side of how do we interact with the outside world as opposed to how do we optimize the rack process. So uh, I might throw the question back at you actually and say in your experience with the Catalyst, um, what were some of the design choices you had there? Yeah, no, like I'm, I'm happy to. So, like, this is the, um, like, uh, there, are like, well, of course, many, many methods there. What you can choose, and, uh, and also, like, I got many questions, especially like coming back from Cisco Live, is that, um, how do you like process the data? How you chunk it, especially when it comes to, um, Cisco data sheets, and you have like tabular data. How do, especially, import it into your vector database so that the like LM can understand it specifically. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say the answer uh, is, in a way, like to basically format it into into, into proper format, like, for example, markdown uh, tables, which I experienced is like GPT-4 at least, or C even 3.5 can understand really good um, with uh, with Llama 3 also uh, sometimes. So like I have some some I had some difficulties there, but then managed in the end. Um, but I think this is um, also like the itself, like the, uh, the the format and so on is definitely very important to bring um, 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 uh, all the data in, um, which then brings me to the other questions. That, like since we are then now at the uh, at the agent level, there is now that we are pulling like a data or like um, the uh, data from vector database and also like asking the LM there, um, what um, and uh, maybe this question for for Cody there is about uh, how do you do this, um, especially now with uh, in an agentic style? Like, um, do you do it now with function calling these kinds of things, or are you having like specifically? like specific function translated from a natural language then as you said before, like um, the, for example, like a classic SQL task or something like that, and then translate it and then having the results uh, turn back, like maybe like cover more bit of this whole process there. We got already some data vector database, now we have the agent there. And how does this like the subtask, how, how does this look like approximately mm -hmm. there? Yeah, so I think it depends slightly on the agent framework that you're using. I typically use LangChain. Uh, which provides an agent framework for interacting um, that uh, primarily uses uh, different tools, or that is the way that I use them for, for tool calling. I think also a distinction to make is between structured and unstructured data. So some of the really interesting agents we've built is with actually structured data, where we have something like SQL, or um, primarily I've used like Panda data frames in Python and created some really interesting agents where uh, we loaded the structured data into a data frame where we have you know kind of named columns and rows um, and what we saw with the agent is we can essentially generate um, given a prompt we can instead of looking through all the data we will generate a query that then tries to answer whatever the prompt we had so kind of a, a very efficient way of trying to retrieve the information um, we found that this is a powerful way to analyze really large amounts of structured data. So we had, we built an agent for Cisco Spaces, for instance, where we had kind of massive amounts of, um, of telemetry data coming in from Cisco Spaces and user visits data 
and we had kind of megabytes of data coming in that we put into a structured uh, pandas data frame and we could very quickly um, issue requests like uh, what is uh, which day of the week has the highest user um, occupancy and it would very quickly generate um, a query to, to answer that and return the result because we didn't have to search through all the data we just had to run a query across it um, and another interesting part of that is we started to look into uh, graphings and uh, plotting so we could tell the agent now can you generate a plot for user occupancy um, over the course of the last month um, and then within that agent flow, we added a tool to essentially, um, you know, generate or execute generated code. And that code could be like a map plot, um, you know, plotting uh, function. So we could actually generate images um, from that function. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, the topic here was like using RAG and, and building domain specific specific agents and when we're talking about how do people are probably like saying okay well how do i code it and how do i do it i mean we could show we could show some of the ones we got if we zoom in on like maybe the just the not showing the frames maybe we could just zoom in and show like the, the stock ticker ones or something like that we we have we've built agents for electricity maps um um cisco spaces so we can do things like asking you know, what is what is the energy consumption uh, for a location because we hooked it to to um, Cisco Spaces, but then we could also say what is the stock price at the same instant say what is the stock price going on for this and trend it over time. So once you start building agents and you have bunches of them, the power really goes to having lots of them that have that are very specific. So if somebody came in saying, okay, I want to figure out how to code it. You're going to figure out how to code it. This isn't about how to code it. We're, we're talking about here. Go and code a whole bunch of small ones. Not, don't try to don't try to build a giant one. Build a whole bunch of small ones and get a collection of them. One that does stock. One that does your HR. One that does spaces. One that does uh, that hooks to um, carbon. Another one that goes in and talks to Thousand Eyes. Another one that talks to your Kubernetes jobs. Get bunches of them together. Then you're really going to hit the power of of having domain specific agents with RAG. Doing one is interesting, right? Everybody's going to figure it out. Chunk size, this we'll figure it out, right? But once you have thousands of them and uh, that are doing different different things, you're really going to see the power of it. That's why when I said, "Hey, what are we doing with Gorilla?" Gorilla was really good at trying to make sense of bunches of agents. So, telling you what we could talk about in some other a, another podcast when we start to release things. What happens when you have bunches of them and then you want to talk to them? That's going to be the interesting thing. So if anybody's saying, what do I do with RAG? Build a whole bunch of small ones that are very, very specific. That's the trend that we're seeing with everybody at the labs do that. And Cody's been building tons of these of, of these little ones. Um, and that's the way I would go for it. One, spread, you know, one agent that's really good at one spreadsheet, one that's good at this. Yeah. yeah, it looks like uh, API is really the key elements uh, to retrieve uh, the data. Uh, how do you guys uh, handle, for example, uh, different HTTP errors, for example, 429 or something like this? Yeah, so when building an API for, um, sorry, building agent for APIs, there's a few different approaches um, that I've looked into. So one approach is you essentially can take an API, open a, um, API spec that you want to communicate with, and you create an agent that essentially has like a RAG uh, mechanism that then kind of learns what the API spec is, generates calls, and makes calls um, based on the API spec. Um, I think we found that while that does work as the open API specs get uh, get large, kind of accuracy comes down a bit. So what uh, the approach that I used more is essentially defining agent tools as specific API routes. So if we think about Thousand Eyes, for instance, I've kind of manually defined different functions that uh, will go out and um, you know get Thousand Eyes agents or get Thousand Eyes tests and define that as a as a function call as a tool that we then give to the agent. So the agent now has a well defined way of retrieving that. So Air handling in that scenario would be done within the function that I define for the API call. Um, and then the uh, how do you handle that within the agent? That's actually a really interesting problem. And I don't know if it's completely uh, you know, understood of what the best way to do it. 
Um, if you just provide an air string to an agent, to an LLM, how does it handle that? It's somewhat, uh, somewhat interesting and ambiguous how it's going to handle that because, um, you know, it's not necessarily well trained on how to be within kind of an air scenario. So that's where maybe the agent kind of um, mechanism can take hold of, okay, if the LLM is going through now just a vicious cycle of like seeing errors and not knowing what to do um, to maybe stop that. Or um, within the function that you write, the tool for making the API call, if you, if you receive an error, return something to the LLM that allows it to easily just calm down and like, you know, and stop. So I'll say there's a few different kind of approaches, but um, yeah, I don't know, Flo, do you have any? Uh, any thoughts there as well? Uh, actually, like um, uh, so, uh, like uh, uh, being at the topic there is about uh, what comes to my mind is about like what do you think about or how do you see agent to agent communication? So now mm -hmm. you have like a bunch of agent there and yeah. like how do they communicate like natural language on and so on like and this, uh, we are not yeah. of course like this is like we're sub just at the beginning but how you see how you see as well like uh, the, the future will evolve in this way. Yeah, so that's actually a lot of a lot of the research that we've uh, that we've been working on there. So that's a really interesting problem. So how do you have agents that now communicate together? So you need a bit of a kind of standardized um, interface for how you communicate. Um, but what we've looked at is how can an agent? So we have a natural language kind of barrier of how you how you um, run an agent, but there are still certain parameters that maybe the um you know what you're trying to achieve within the agent needs so again well let's take the example of you have an agent that is trained to make an uber call there are certain parameters you need to make an uber call you need a source location and you need a target location right so in order for those agents to communicate they communicate over natural language but the uber agent needs to somehow tell the top level agent even though I communicate over natural language, there are certain requirements that I need in order to be run correctly. So we've looked at how do we create a protocol to enable agents to communicate by kind of broadcasting the arguments they, they might need. So one way to think about this is you create a small open API spec um, for the agents and they would essentially have a handshake of the open API specs uh, with the kind of parameters and different yeah. types of media types, and, um, and that's the to... type of that's the type of fun research that we're going on. Like again, it's the pets versus cattle, right? Like right now, when you're looking at RAG, you're like, okay, can I get an agent to be to be smart on one kind of data or enhanced API? Great. Now, what happens when you have thousands? That's a whole other topic that we could be talking about. We could do a podcast on that one and talk <laughs> about the research on that. How do they communicate? How do... How do they how do they do the error handling? How do they pass parameters? That is so interesting. That's a Cisco thing, right? What happens when you want to go big and cover a planet with thousands of these things or tens of millions of these things? And how do they interoperate? How do they communicate? That's what we're all about. Like the protocols between things. That's what we see mm -hmm. Cisco like. Yeah. That's our that's what we want to play, right? Taking an agent and having one is great. Thousands unbelievable right so how do they communicate so we could talk about forever on that one that that's the part that we we're like experimenting with but i i'd say to the people that are out there in your enterprises and things start to get them start to get your data lined up then start to build very small agents so that you can you can get to the point that we're at now okay now what can i do when i combine them all together how are they going to communicate and stuff it's going to play out a lot of different ways many different protocols and stuff but um, it'll it'll quiesce down into one thing, and then I know we're going to have our products that are going to are going to line up with that. We then you're going to have even get it because we think about the future. What happens when you have all those protocols going? The next thing that everybody developer is going to be is, can I check that protocol? Can I look at that thing? Can I secure it? Who's eavesdropping on that one? What happens if this person at the end of that is now misbehaving? Right. And, and it, what the heck is this thing doing? It's it's a vicious actor in this thing and, and it's participating in that. That's where this is all going to. We're not there yet. We're, where everybody's like, ooh, can I build one? Right. Let's try to build one and then we'll get to that. Yeah. Yeah. We have uh, three minutes left. Um, um, I want to ask you quickly summarize about the main specific agent and about tools that can be helpful for created. Yeah. Tools. Um, I would say. Definitely looking at the open source world, 
hugging face, the different models. I think it, the open source community is is pretty amazing out there. So just being aware of what is the open source version of things, and then start just playing around with um, with LangChain, um, the different types of kind of uh, vector databases that are out there: Pinecone, Elasticsearch, um, MongoDB. Um, and I think just starting with small examples and then trying to see, okay, how do I then translate that to the data that I have and the data that I'm curious about um, and looking at, um, you know, does RAG make sense uh, based on the data that I have or does fine tuning make sense? I think the data that you have is really is what's going to define kind of how you are going to, um, to build these RAG agents. Yeah, it's a good point. It's like, do you, do you do you fine tune the model and train it, or do you just API call it? That's the big decision point that you're going to have to make. So one, I'd say get your data together, right? That's hygiene, right? Then make decisions if you're going to be using the APIs or if you're going to be retraining the models. After you start to build some of these things, you got a good bookkeeping on this stuff, which is like we were talking about, like having the your Jupyter notebooks in there, or your best practices of like using Backstage or things like that. Those things get really, really important when you have tons of them, and there's nothing really out there yet. Maybe there will be of that you can keep track of these things, but start to use the best practices that you have of keep your data, get your data in order, figure out how to call the APIs, but then keep track of what you're doing with playbooks and things like that. And also from my side, I, I would like to say is that um, like there are a bunch of the the CLM high, like the score. Um, then like always like new models are coming out and so on. So I'm a fan of like first of all like stop doing focus on one LM which you think is the right one, and then focus on your code, focus on your data because the selection of the LM is just one part uh, of the whole process there. And then afterwards, uh, like experience uh, experience more and these kinds of things. And of course, uh, when it comes uh, for the agents, like there's some. Uh, frameworks at least out there or some also which go in this direction i would say explore um or but but first uh, as john said before like at first get your data together then go to rag or maybe do some fine tuning there and then actually build on top of these uh, of these yeah. pillars there and then create basically then you can connect um all of the uh, agents together so like I, I think we are all in the same shoes like uh, all of us um um checking okay what are the others yeah, yeah. doing what are the other companies doing yeah, yeah. what are the other people doing and then in the end it's like all about experimenting and then yeah like, that's a good point you know you just you just reminded me you know what's good about keeping it small build a domain specific agent on a small set of data great but then if you did that then you could try out a different one and then you'd be able to compare them if you try to do these things too huge there's no way to compare two of them together Right. So right. basically grab your favorite you know, problem domain, get it just on a spreadsheet and, and have one model go against it. Then do exactly the same thing in the next one, still mm -hmm. using their rag concepts, but trying it with a different one. And then you can you can battle the two of them together. Well, this one sucks. This one ran up my bill. This one's too slow. This one's this one was easier to code and you can make those decisions. From our point of view at Cisco, it's like do with them all like we'll, we'll we'll try to handle them all. There's going to be tons of them. You know. Yeah, I think there's so many different types of techniques too that it's uh, yeah. it's hard to tell what's right. You know, we ran into a problem of, you know, we're building a rag system, but then with the amount of data, even though it seemed like a lot, we had a model that could take really large context length and actually just throwing all of the data directly to the LM in the prompt returned a better result than, you know, creating this kind of vector store. So experimenting, experimenting with yeah. just different kind of, uh, um, you know, types of, uh, of retrieval systems and agents is, is fun and also may return results that you didn't expect. Yeah, thanks a lot for sharing this information, uh, Flo and I. We're glad to, to hear from you, John and Cody, and uh, hopes to see you when you released uh, some of your product. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here.